Sun, high sigh from the Ryukyu Kingdom of Okinawa, Japan. You are listening to the Shima Gaijin Podcast with your host, Joe Isamu Davis. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too, Joe. I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having no, me. Was it like uh, 10 o'clock at night, Nashville? It's uh, a little after 10, yeah. So it's a good time for me because I'm t- typically blown off work by about now. <laughs> I, that's kind of how I'm compensating for being, you know, sequestered here in my condo is I just work. That's all I do now. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what, 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 yeah, how's the COVID affecting what you do? Well, the, um, you know, musically, it's it's all shut down. Everything's shut down here in town. There's this terrible thing happening in Nashville right now, and that is there's a decree by the city that bars can't be open. But all of the bars that operate downtown where, you know, <clears throat> it's like Bourbon Street on in, in downtown Nashville on Broadway. It's exactly what it's like. If you ever been to Bourbon Street, it's just like that. Mm. Except they don't close the street off, but it's both sides of it for blocks. It's nothing but honky tonk after honky tonk after honky tonk. And those guys have found a way to subvert the health order and they're open for business. And none of those knuckleheads down there are wearing masks. And no. <clears throat> all the bars that are the, you know, all these other pe- places that I would go, because that's so touristy, I don't go hang out there usually. Except when Dave comes to town, we went down. Dave's got a good story to tell about that one later. Yeah, that, maybe now. Yeah, that's a good that's a good story. By all the right, way. Yeah. There. go ahead, tell that well, story. Well, no, first of all, it's like Bourbon Street without the heroin. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> huh. hey, as far as you know, as far as we know, <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be some sort of drug that creates cre- creativity over there, right? Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's it's definitely a great music town. There's no doubt about it. Every time that Dave and Mary come to town. We always end up having a great time. We, you know, awesome recording sessions, and um, and then we'll take off and go play somewhere usually, and so. eat ourselves into a coma. Yeah, totally. And uh, well, before I tell that story, Rich, uh, I, I was trying to explain because it, it's you have a very difficult. Uh, it's not di- well. It's difficult because you're you got like eight different cool jobs, <laughs> right? Rich has got I'm like. Yeah, a pro musician, and then you do the, the promotion stuff. So go ahead and tell Joe about that, because I think you can explain it way better than I can. Yeah, I got the song called Math. It's the first song on my record, Blame Bobby Bear. And there's a line in there on the second second or third verse. I don't claim to be a juggler, but I am anyway. Yeah, it's just like, it's just kind of my life, man. I just like, yeah, that sounds cool. I'll add that to the mix. And there I am. You know, there's a couple of cats and a hamster and a guinea pig. And, but I... <laughs> My day gig for a long time after I, I, I was in a band and we were signed and we were touring all the time. And then I got out of that. That band was called Van Halen? <laughs> yeah, but it was right in between the David Lee Roth. You know, it was just like, it was this short, short tour. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm sorry. But anyway, I got into radio promotion. I did that for a long time. And then the whole time I was recording because... You know, I want to do my own stuff. So, you know, I learned how to do Pro Tools. Before that, I had a reel-to-reel tape deck. And before that, I had a four-track cassette, you know, recorder. And uh, I started producing radio specials when I was working at Rhino Records. And then podcasts started happening. And I'm like, podcast is just a radio special that's not on terrestrial radio. So I started doing that. And now... That's my jam. That's what I do. I love doing it because I love working in Pro Tools. One of my strengths is editing. I'm a, you know, he says modestly, I sound like Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. I'm a good editor. I'm a good editor. <laughs> but I, um, I love it. And so I do the Rhino podcast. I produce and host that. And I'm also the um, producer and co host and of uh, the new Grateful Dead podcast, the good old Grateful Dead cast. And I do that with Jesse Jarno, who's the writer. And Man, the podcast is going gangbusters. It's the number one music podcast on Apple Podcasts. It's the number one trending podcast. Last week, it was the number one trending podcast in the world. 
That's that awesome. Suck. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just off to the races. And I love it because it's so creative. And I feel so fortunate to be able to do it because I'm a huge deadhead. I've been a you know, fan of the dead since 1985. So, how do you do the, re the research? A long that. time before that, you know, people were doing it 20 years before that. But I, you know, I found it as soon as I got there, as soon as I could. <laughs> yeah. Is there a lot of research that goes into that, that uh, the Grateful Dead cast? Oh, yeah. And that's really where Jesse's strength lies. He's, um, he's an author by trade. And oh. so he's, man, and he's just a sleuth. He's really good at uncovering all kinds of stuff. It's cool Brilliant. listening to some of that, the music that, that you, you, you talk about uh, in, the, in that dead cast, because I listened to an episode, you know, you revert back to some of the, the music that some people have never even heard before. Oh, yeah. Recordings. The Uncle John yeah. episode, Uncle John's band episode, which is the first episode one. Jesse found this Macedonian folk group from the early 60s that had this, you know, it's traditional Macedonian folk music. And there's this one part in the chorus where Jerry Garcia totally lifted the melody. It's like, oh, um, oh, oh, and I want to know is Are You Kind? It's like the melody in that, not the words, but just the, you know, the tune of the vocal is totally from that song and to be able to juxtapose the two in the podcast next to each other and play that section where jerry would sing it and then play the macedonian folk song and hear where it came from we love shining a light on stuff like that i mean deadheads are they have a desire to learn about that band like maybe no other fans of any other band do they really have a kind of an unquenchable thirst for knowledge about that band and I think that we're giving them some stuff to think about that maybe they haven't thought about yet, which is really cool. Is that Macedonian band's lawyer been on the phone to uh, the Grateful Dead folks after that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it be 30 seconds of any clip as a demonstration as long as it's, uh, you know, it's making a point in there. We can't just use it as background music. You know. <laughs> At least that's what the lawyers told us. Man, what how was many, your uh, first exp Oh, go ahead, David. No, I was oh, going to say, how many, what, what kind of downloads are you guys getting what kind of numbers are we talking about on the, the dead cast oh man um god i just looked at it the other day the new podcast the new episode posted on um thursday morning and by like 10 a.m i think it was already up to 3,000 downloads and it doesn't sound like a ton but if you like look at numbers for podcasts to have something at 9 a.m in the morning i already have 3,000 downloads is that's pretty good man but it's boy it's i'm telling you it's like um God, I can't remember that first episode now is up to, I think, about 25,000 downloads. You've been rolling about a month with this, month and a week. David, our, our episode has 55 downloads. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> the hell with you, Rich. Let me show you what, the, let me show you what big numbers look like on the Shima Gaijin podcast. <laughs> so uh, what's it like right now this time of year over at Okinawa? What's the weather like? Uh satan you know what though no, hold on a second I, i'm just looking at my phone right now did you see that joe we got some kind of tropical storm watch thing coming in yeah we're in storm watch right now yeah i guess I mean, the typhoon about, might be on its way or it's, it's a tropical depression over by the philippines coming up yeah it's supposed to rain the next couple of days now do they but call is it a typhoon when it's in your part of the world and a hurricane when it's over here yeah in the, in the southern united states they call it a hurricane hurricane <laughs> They call it a hurricane and work. But yeah, yeah, man. Um, the typhoons are no big deal. Why are there typhoons over there? I've never heard. I've never understood that. I don't know, Joe. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not a historian. I don't know. That's a little above our pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we'll, we'll get it to the bottom. Hot, <laughs> it's been, In my previous this year, but David, this year is this year has definitely been uh, like the Okinawa that we're, I think we're all used to, where it's just. Oh, dude, Hot and humid 90 degrees, 100 percent humidity, and you're yeah. you just don't want to go outside. And then it gets down to 88 at night or whatever. It's awesome. <laughs> Does it rain in the afternoons because it gets so hot and humid? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. But it did yesterday. Yeah, There's a couple of skulls here and there. I wouldn't even know because I don't go outside, Rich. It's terrible. Well, yeah, you're under house arrest, aren't you? Oh, dude. Yeah, well, now, I mean, what, we have another 100 cases of COVID yesterday, Joe, right? Another yeah. 100 new ones. So we're we're looking like Florida uh, in the South China Sea. No, 
And I thought you yeah. guys played under control. Oh, dude. We, so did we. And it just exploded. It, like, yeah. within a week. Yeah. Yeah. Like 50, just like 40, 80, 100. Yeah. Wow. And that's like that's like ten thousand, you know. I, you know, because we're we're like per capita, we're the number one prefecture in all of Japan now. That's the highest. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're leading the way. We're the Florida of Japan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Normally, we're the Kentucky of the United States, but now we're the Florida. <laughs> right. There's uh, this guy. There's this guy, Hickok Forty Five. He lives here in Nashville, and he's a He's a firearms enthusiast, and he, he does reviews, and he's got this killer range on his property. It's so – it's it's really bitching. And so he was <laughs> – I can't remember what he was talking about. Let's say he was shooting an AR. He's like, this one's chambered in 5.56. Five, five, That's 2.23 two, for our friends up in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> he's just – he just burns them. All hey. the time, he's always burning Kentucky. I don't know what it is, man. Well, I think everybody – yeah, uh, Kentucky's kind of like the – you know, the little stepbrother that everybody like bangs on. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least in, in our area. <laughs> Rich, how'd you move? Uh, what made you move to Nashville? Because originally you're from California. I am, yeah. Um, I've lived all over the state. Uh, well, not all over, but from Southern California, you know, to the Bay Area and then the Central Coast too, which is really cool. Uh, it's all great. But, um, I got laid off from Rhino, and then, you know, a few months later, they hired me back as a consultant. It's kind of the way it goes these days. But my wife at the time, now my ex-wife, didn't really like California. She was from Ohio, and then uh, when I met her, she'd been living in Atlanta for 10 years. And I think that, you know, especially Southern California – the place that we moved back to is the place that I grew up in. And, you know, it, it's socially, it's different than a lot of the rest of the country. And I think she felt like she never could get into it, but hard to say. I mean, anyway, we decided we were going to move because also too, we were having a really hard time buying a house. I mean, it's just, you know, it just a, a cheap house, a fixer upper is a you know well over half a million dollars. Yeah, ridiculous. And um, at the same time, my landlord, who was a friend of mine, and was giving us a smoking rent deal, um, told us that his girlfriend was pregnant and they needed to move into the house. So I'd gotten laid off and was gonna have to look for a place to live too, and know that it was gonna, like our rent was about to go up at least fifty percent. And I, I just thought, well, you know, everything factored into it, all of it. You know, I know you don't like it here. Well, why don't we move to Nashville? It's a music town. I've got friends there. She had family in Huntsville, which is only two and a half hours south. It just made sense. And it's been a really great move. I mean, I, I love it here. It's, the people are amazing. It's beautiful. There's wildlife all like crazy right out my front door. There was a coyote that walked right in front of my place and took a picture of the day. Yeah, we had five bucks come up from the creek right across the way yesterday. And I was just like, man, look at this place. Possums, raccoons, turtles, fish. And you got Prince's, was it uh, Chicken Shack? We got Prince's Hot Chicken Shack. We got Nashville Hot Chicken. <laughs> There's, you know, when the, when the plague isn't in full effect, it's probably the best live music town in the country. And I think, you know, people from Austin would probably fight you on that. But... They don't play live Austin music in Austin cool. anymore. Austin cool. Austin's very cool. I they love don't play. Austin. They don't play music in Austin anymore. What are you talking about? <laughs> nah, well, they don't play music anywhere anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but man, it's just like once you come here and you see what it's like, you have everybody's like, I had no idea. You don't know. Like in your mind, if you're thinking Nashville arts in the South, you think cowboy hats, cowboy boots, hicks, whatever. But That's I'm what I thought, man. Once you get out here and see it, and there's so many venues. And now in the past 10 years, this town has blown up, and there's all these celebrity chefs that have moved here. The restaurants are killer now. Um, the nightlife is fantastic. There's great – I mean, we've got a killer symphony. It's – you know, you got the Ryman. I mean, it's there's so many excellent venues to see musicians. And now musicians want it – they always want to stop here and play because it's such a music town. The audience is – love music and they're intelligent music audiences here. Yeah. They really get it. They really get it. 
David, that must have been a great experience for Mary. Oh, man. It was a great experience for me. Remember yeah. the first time I went there and them guys picked me up. I, like, just like he said, you, you don't really – because you already get – you got this thing in your head about, oh, it's going to be all about country music and this, that, and the other. And it's absolutely not. I mean, it is if you're looking for that. If you want to see all that pop country stuff, you can go to Broadway and see that. But then you go anywhere else and you'll see – the greatest musicians that there are in the world working at Waffle House, working at a gas station. <laughs> Tell me yeah. I'm wrong, Rich. No, that's like Vince Gill has a, a famous saying. He's like, Nashville, the place where the guy who parks your car is a better guitar player than me. <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's really kind of scary. I mean, how good everybody is there. They come from all over this part of the, you know, the country for sure. A lot of guys go to New York or L.A. to play music and, you know, but people come from a large part of the United States. If they're the best person in their town, they know they need to go somewhere else where they're not in order to become better. And they come here and it's this town is the humbler, man. You can go out. It's like it's so hard. Once you've been playing music for a long time and Dave will back this up that it's really hard to get inspired, like where your jaw hits the floor and you're like, Holy mackerel, that guy's good. Like, really just, where it really just makes you shake your head. Like, you can't believe somebody that is just playing stuff that's so fresh and so creative and inventive that it just makes you excited about music right then and again. And here, that happens with more regularity than any place else I've lived in my life. I mean, I've seen some amazing guys do some amazing stuff. But I mean, it's just in a, it's just in a honky tonk or a small club, and they're just burning. I mean, J.D. Simon, Matt Lee, all these guys, uh, Daniel Donato. I mean, they're all just it's just mutants. They're so yeah, good. they're world class. I remember we yeah. we went the first time I came in there. I mean, there's a bunch of stories I could tell, but I remember we went to see Rich. We saw your band in. Uh, what was that? I can't remember that little place. It was down on Music Row. It was the last one, and I don't know it's still there anymore. What was that little oh, place? Bobby Vital Hour. Yeah, and yeah. and no, this is how this is how tiny and that, what just give you an idea. This is all I need to say. The only beer they have in there was Pabst, <laughs> <laughs> and they were his band was ripping it to the fucking floor. I mean, they were just like tearing it down, and there was like six people in there, including me. <laughs> and I was just like, holy freaking crap. Like, we get done and, like, a few people would clap and the, the owner would be like, hey, Rich, you play that one thing that you do the cold, uh, her, he, her, or whatever. And they just start playing. And I was just like, I couldn't even believe it, man. And, and it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's a cool place. I mean, the beer there is super cold. Dave, they have <laughs> good cold as well. I'll let you know. They yeah, what? It's like there's no beer. There's no beer on tap. It's all like cans and tall boys, but it's super cold. <laughs> that's what's yeah. important. That's what's important. It's like my my buddy Chelvis, who plays bass with me all the time, and he's a good guitar player too. But he's like, I'm like, what's your favorite beer? He's like, cold. What's your second favorite beer? Free. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How hey, did uh, you two meet? Maybe I got those confused. I think it's the other uh, way. Around. <laughs> free cold. Yeah, cold. Uh, well, Rich, you want to tell it or you want me to tell the story about how we met? Oh, you tell it, Dave. I've been talking my, my I've been yelling. Your, it's your show. I mean, I'm on here all the time. Nobody gives a shit about what I say. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so, um, so, yeah. So, uh, back to my radio promotion stuff. I was approached by this guy, Todd Glazer, who lives up in Alaska, cool radio promoter. He does blues format. And he got a hold of me and he's like, hey, I got this artist, David Ralston. He is looking to get more into like Americana stuff, which is the stuff that I, that was one of the, the genres that I work. And he started telling me about him and he's like, oh yeah, man, he's, you know, he's been produced by Delaney Bramlett. And I went like, you could have just heard the record go, because I'm a huge Delaney and Bonnie fan. And like, you know, I, I was lucky enough to see Delaney and his band play at Trachis in, uh, you know, Zuma Beach when I was younger, and my dad gave me a cassette of Delaney and Bonnie and friends on tour with Eric Clapton when I was 16 or 17, and I was just like, what is this music? This is amazing. So anyway, when 
Todd told me that Dave had worked with Delaney. I'm like, well, I, I got to talk to this guy. So we started talking and eventually he came to Nashville for a conference for work, if I recall correctly. Is yeah. I'll take over from here, Rich. Oh, well. this, this is where this is what, what happened was it's like I never all I knew Rich was I think I called him one time on the phone. And, uh, you know, I was like, OK, he's cool. And I said, well, I'm going to be staying at some grand old Opry hotel where we're doing this some conference thing. And he goes, all right, I'll come pick you up. And, and I don't know, Rich, you were driving some car. And I, I think it was missing a couple hubcaps, man. But you came and picked me up. Uh, it was like a green <laughs> it was a green two door with two guys in the car and they wave at me and they look kind of sketchy because, you know, I don't know, man, I don't know who these people are. I mean, I, I've never met these guys <laughs> as we get, I get in the car, you know, I crawl in the back and and this dude that was with him was Brian Harrison. And man, he's like as country as can be, you know, God rest his soul. And from Mississippi he turns around and he goes, hey man, he goes, you ever tried hot chicken? <laughs> That's the first thing they said, right? And I go, no. He goes, well, I'm going to take you back down to the part of Nashville or uh, Steve Earl used to buy his crack. That's where the place is at. You cool with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the first time you met him, right? Oh, and then yeah. he said, did he? I mean, I didn't even, that was the first thing I was like, goes, I call that the suicide part of town. <laughs> what, is that what he said, right? Something no, it's the different. suicide of town. The suicide of town. Yeah. <laughs> so we go, <laughs> so we go down, that we're driving down to this place. I mean, it's, it's not the, uh, it's not the nicest part of uh, any town that I've ever been in, but it's like there's a wig shop on one side of the strip mall and there's a liquor store on the other. And then the prince's place is right in the middle. And uh, that was pretty scary, man, because they got like church pews is what the chairs are in there. And there's a, a, a lady with a beard serving cake in there. It's just weird. <laughs> it's totally down home. It was a chicken shack. Yeah, it and it was, was chicken shack. I don't know, man. I don't know how many health standards that place would uh So – Dave, to, but. Dave's like, what do I get? And we're like, Brian says, Brain was what everybody called him. Brain goes, well, I'll tell you this much. It ain't called Nashville medium chicken. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we get the hot. Well, I think Dave did get, I think Dave got mild because he doesn't do good with spicy food. Yeah, but see in there, they mix it all together. They don't care, man. They didn't. What? So the other thing that was weird about that that story too is I'm sitting and, like, there's people coming in. There's, like, people that are probably – they're probably homeless, like, asking for money in there and stuff. And you, th these two guys get up and leave. We'll be right back, man. I'm like, man, what the hell? I'm si I met them. I've been in a, known them for 15 minutes. I'm sitting in this – in a church pew in this place. It was just – it was like a, something out of a Tim Burton film, right? I'm sitting there, and there's a lot of craziness happening. And they come back with these – they come back with these paper bags. I'm like, what's that? It's like, uh – they won't let you drink beer in here unless it's in a bag. <laughs> I got a photo. That photo is on your in your house somewhere. Yeah, we went down to that gas station on the corner and got a couple forties and some styrofoam <laughs> coffee cups. We brought it back and you pour it under the table so you don't get caught. And, and, and I knew at that moment, hot chicken. Yeah, and I knew at that moment I'm going to be friends with this guy for the rest of my life, man. That was the first 20 minutes, and I'm with these guys. And we laughed the entire time. Because, yeah. you know, with, with with Joe, you know how it is, man. When you get with guys like all Just of us, click. it's like, well, yeah, that. And it's not like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. It's always like. The stories always build, and it just and I'm I'm like bent over at the waist, like laughing. So I'm eating this food, and and these guys, you know, they're they're eating it like it's nothing. It, look, I'm sitting there going, I'm sweating. I can start to feel like beads of sweat like going down my back into my pants. You know, I'm like, damn, this is like something else. And they only live like what, maybe 15 minutes away or 20 minutes. Yeah, so we're driving we're driving back, man. I'm like, dude, you guys got to hurry up. And they're like, ah, uh. I'm like, no, I'm serious, man. You guys need to hurry. And I, man, I, I, I was running, holding my butt, running to, to Brian's bath. I know him, right? I was going to his house, and I'm running into his bathroom. Dude, I barely made it, man. It was, that was traumatic, man. But it was awesome. It's delicious, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. <laughs> there you go, got, Joe. If I ever go to Nashville, I got, I got to bring a shit bag with me. <laughs> oh, I got, yeah. <laughs> Every time. We'll take you, man. It, it's good. Princess is the best too. It really is. It's delicious. Other and places Brian, are good, but that place is the best. Yeah. Brian, uh, is that is that Brain? That that yeah. was your friend who, who passed away? You did. He was a big yeah. part of your uh, your records, right? Oh, yeah, man. 
Yeah, we'd still be recording over there if he was still around. There's no doubt about it. But he, uh, I don't know, it was about three years after that, he just, man, he died of a massive heart attack. And yeah, he was, wow. uh, we did, um, well, hell, I did two or two full records over there. I don't know how many did you do, Rich? Uh, I just did one. Yeah, and it was, I mean, he, he'd call the, the best players in town, like dudes that play on everybody's stuff, and they'd all come over oh, yeah. in a minute. And it, we just sit there and laugh. We'd what laugh year did you guys up. meet? What what year was that when you guys met? When you went down there, David? Man, it was probably nine years ago or so, Rich. Okay. I think it was I... 2011, yeah. I think it was oh. nine years ago. So then, fast forward. When did when did Mary go down there? 2016, 17? Uh, somewhere. Two or, it's 2017, I think, or yeah. 16 or 17. But one more. I'm gonna tell another story about that. So we. And we told this on our show, but when she ate that volcano burger that no oh, one yeah. else could ever eat, she ate the whole thing. And I don't know, Rich, you can probably tell what what was on that thing. Oh, yeah. So there's a place, the Poor House, which is just right around the corner from here. And, you know, it's a sports bar. They've got, you know, like 100 taps behind the bar. You know what I mean? One of those joints. But the food's pretty good. So I said, well, let's just go there. And Mary says, well, what are you going to have? And I said, well, I'm going to have the Inferno Burger. It's not on the menu, but here's what it is. It's a, it's a pretty decent-sized patty that's been marinating in habanero sauce. And then they cook it on the grill in this sauce. And then when they take it off and put it on the bun, they, they put on both sides of the bun, they put more of this habanero sauce. They melt some pepper jack cheese over the top of it, top it off with pickled jalapenos and bacon, and then all that stuff. And then it's just you bite into it and your mouth is on fire. I don't know what it it's, is about hot food in this town, but, man, they can do it. And it's big. It's like, yeah. it's like, this, it's like this big. I mean, it's, it's like you can't – it's just it's it's my, it's my, my, my shame. Yeah, it's probably about that, that big around at least. It's yeah. freaking huge. And she crushed it. She ate the whole thing. Rich it's couldn't awesome. even finish it. Rich ate like half of his. There's something about Japanese women or Okinawan women who can just, they're like as big as my pinky, but they can eat a monstrous burger or, or devour some sort of entree. It's crazy. <laughs> I think it's like a, per a tapeworm thing or something. I don't know what it is. They don't gain any weight. But she was paying for it, though, and about four hours later. She's laying there going, oh, my God, we're laying down in Rich's basement. And I'm on the couch, and she's like, I don't know if I feel very good. I'm like, I wonder why. <laughs> But anyway, so we, that was the first thing we did. And then the next day, we got up and we went to record, like, straight away. We went to Dave Rose's place. And um, we recorded over there. And so we, we do a full Dave recording. And it was it was awesome. And Rich is like, hey, you guys want to stop somewhere, uh, get some food, maybe see some music? Because Mary's never been there. So we went to Broadway. Normally, we wouldn't go there if Mary wasn't there. But uh, anyway, so we go down there. And it was like, we park in the back. We, this is exactly what happened. I'm not making this up. If it could have been like a, a, a film, it would have been. We're following Rich in. To the, I don't know what what was the club. Was it Lucy's or one of those? Uh, it called. was no. It was um, um, right next to Roberts. Why am I blanking? It's um... <laughs> well. Anyway, we yeah. we, we, walk, we walk into Layla's. This place. Layla's. Layla's. Okay. Layla's. So we walk into Layla's. It's packed. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, tell them how we got in. Well, we went in the back door. Yeah. Right? So we didn't go in the front. front door, but there's a door in the alleyway that nobody yeah. knows about. So we, we go in the back. We walk straight in. And I mean, it's like what you think. It was like, it's like country music going, and there's people everywhere. Everybody's pretty. There's all these. It was crazy. It was like, Mary's like, this is like freaking television. It's like being on a movie set. <laughs> we walk straight to the front, and the girl up there singing is like, oh my God, Rich Mahan. He walks straight. Doesn't even stop to this drink. We walk straight to the stage. They give him a guitar and he starts playing. Dow, 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 dow. He starts playing Big River. Like it was like you couldn't even have scripted it. And Mary's like, she looks at me and she's like, he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was like we rolled in there with Elvis fucking Presley, man. Which is like Elvis in it. I'm not even making rich. I know you don't want to brag, but that's exactly how it went. We didn't even get a chance to, to get drinks, and he's on the stage going down, 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 down,
he just started singing. <laughs> they just handed him a guitar. He walks straight in, goes straight to the stage. And it's long. That's a long ass place. He walks up there and they just give him a guitar. He puts it on and starts playing. Dude, that was that was an awesome moment right there, my friend. Oh man, I know. I want to jam that song right now. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> She's when like, you Rich is awesome. Rich, when you when you met Mary, did you have any kind of exposure to Japanese like music? Like, uh, yeah, sorry, totally. Shami Sen. Or... As a matter of fact, before that, yeah. we had a big session over at Brain's place that was really fun. When um, uh, Dave was playing with Azusa at that point in time, and Dave's manager Hiromi came over too. Oh, okay. And uh, Hiromi made some killer Japanese curry for dinner one night. I remember having that? And, <laughs> We had a great hang, man. And there were some other players that you brought over, too, if I recall correctly. I can't remember who they were. Well, we had the drummer, Namikawa, and then uh, old Chad Watson on bass. That was pretty sick session. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, and then we went down and jammed on Broadway after that, too. Remember yeah, we went when, down to um, Blue, what was it? Not Bluegrass Underground. Um, it was uh, the, the National Underground or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that place still there? It is. And yeah. that's when uh, and Charlie Rich was in the audience. That's right. Charlie Rich was there. We got up and we played some blues. And Chad was just a monster on stage. He was going yeah. off. It's pretty cool, though, Joe, when you can just meet somebody. And it's like we've been friends for our whole lives. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, that's, those, yeah. those are rare opportunities, man. I don't know. We've had some good times, man. We, had, oh, we did a tour down in Florida once. that was <laughs> a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> I got accosted. I got accosted by somebody in a giant manatee costume on stage. <laughs> Dude, we played. I mean, it's ridiculous. We played. Why don't we have video of that? Because it was weird. Because it, we played this the Manatee County Blues Festival. It was a big ass show, man. That was a big stage. That was like a real. I mean, that's like a Van Halen sized stage that we were playing on, right? We're big. And I told Rich when I, when I said, "Hey." Can you get a band together? Let's do this. And we're like, okay. And I didn't know what it was going to be. I thought it could have been like on a little trailer stage somewhere. But this thing was like legit. And we get up there and we're playing and I'm, I'm, I'm just rocking my ass off. And I look over and there's a, a somebody in a manatee uh, like costume that looks like a big gray penis. It's like up behind Rich, like jumping up and down. And I was like, what the? it kind of frightened me for a minute because I thought that maybe I was having a stroke or something again. You know, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like behind you, Rich. What, what, why was he so close to you? I don't know, man. He was just like, he just being <laughs> jacked out of the grass. <laughs> you never need to be that close to anybody with that costume on. It's weird. It's creepy. Yeah, that was funny. That's a good trip. That's a good one. <laughs> Hell, the last time we went play, but before the uh, last fall, before this thing went upside down we went up and did a gig uh, a couple gigs up in indianapolis area and that was great both yeah, man, that, smoking those, good. dude those the folks there were just eating that up too because like rich his the guys we had with uh who was it, travis and then uh, uh who's playing drums uh uh eric eric was playing drums and these dudes are like i mean pure just badass rhythm section dudes and then and they just and they're just ripping this stuff out, I, and I'm, I'm just playing slide guitar. I don't have to do nothing, right? Yeah, All I got to do is play slide. Time. There's some good video clips of that, actually. Dave's got some. Yeah, it was – It was, good video clips it was dumb it was good. because it's one of those things, like, where, you know, in Japan, it's kind of weird. Like, I, I sometimes, like, when you play a, a killer solo, right, or if something happens, everybody's like, yeah, you know, they start going nuts in the States. In Japan, they just sit there. And, and just first, stare like, at you. Yeah, and, and I thought, maybe, maybe it's because I – I, mean, I was just killing that shit. Nobody even said anything. And then my friend, one time I was telling him this, he gave me a DVD of uh, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan at uh, uh, the Budokan or whatever he's playing. And, and they're just sitting there like the whole time. And then at the end, they just clap. I'm like, good. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel so bad because he's like lighting himself on fire. You know, he's playing scuttle button and then they're just like this. <laughs> Really yeah, done, why is know? that? I never knew why the Japanese audience, Dude, whether it's sports you know or what? whatever. You know what, you guys? What's weird is the more that I've played in different parts of Japan, it's not like that everywhere. Like Osaka, they'll go nuts. They'll really? scream and yell. Yeah, because they're like yeah. they're really big on 
they're like big blues fans and and that stuff like true. that. And, and if you get around people that like jazz, they'll clap for jazz solo stuff too when people are ripping it out. Uh, but and then like different areas, like some like the smaller dude, smaller towns is where you want to play. And that's kind of the same in the states too, Rich. Yeah. When we go to a small town, man. Like you go to Alabama, they're going freaking crazy. You go to New York City, they're like this. Yeah. Whatever, man. People in small towns are like they're more appreciative of it because people in bigger towns where there's a lot of music coming through all the time, they it's harder to be impressed. Yeah. Have you ever played overseas, Rich? Nope. I sure haven't. Oh, you yeah, why haven't you Japan. been? To, yeah, why haven't you been to Japan again? And don't tell me about your kids, because that's what it works for to get away from your kids. I told you that before. Oh, <laughs> uh, it just hasn't come together yet. But you know, I'm hoping it will soon. Now we'll get him over, Joe. He'll be staying at your house anyway, probably, Joe. When come over. Yeah, no. <laughs> come on over anytime. No, man. Listen, Rich. If you came over here, plus everybody knows you now anyway. So, yeah. like from here, like you got so many friends that. that you've never met <laughs> you'd be like a celebrity for real i'm sure it'd be a blast if i went for only a week i'd probably feel like i got gypped i probably need to go for like oh, two yeah. weeks. No, it, well a week's not enough because you gotta get your time you know your sleep schedule because it's like three days when you're old to get it yeah. together yeah you would definitely have to set up a tour where you guys do all the mainland you know um oh hell yeah there and then yeah oh man. man that'd be so awesome then he'll come man, to Okinawa and, and have culture shock again because it's totally different from mainland Japan. Oh, it's completely different. <laughs> There's a lot of people on Okinawa, though. Aren't there like three million or something? Is there, I don't know. Is there a million and a half, Joe, or something? Oh, man. I know there's definitely over a million. but I remember yeah. when we just hit a million. That was like 20 years ago when I got here, you know? With tourism, well, not anymore. But, yeah, when tourism became big these last few years, yeah, it exploded. Yeah. yeah. Don't you guys get like cruise ships docking there and stuff? Yeah, I'm bringing yeah, Corona, all sorts. Chi of stuff. Yeah, these Chinese folks, man, it's a, nothing but like Chi it's just a Chinese invasion. Like when these five thousand people get off a boat, you know, and they start oh, yeah. rolling in it, like honey badgers. Like, <laughs> it's just, just a horde just going to into they come through. Everything's eaten and destroyed. Yeah, and just eat. completely destroyed. As people, <laughs> yeah, it's not. A, you know what? I think there. It's way better than it used to be. Um, I think people weren't really behaving too well because the folks were just like, we've never been outside of the country, so we're going to go completely nuts. And now I think they're like, okay, they like got church it up and we leave the house, okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, now they even have to have a, give them like a, a sheet of paper before they leave the country saying, all these things that you do in China, do not, not do doing that. Yeah, don't <laughs> shit in the road. Don't go underneath a bridge and take a crap on 58. I mean, that's what people were doing, Rich. They're just like pulling their pants down and just going to the bathroom in different spots. I'm not kidding, man. Spit really? on the ground yeah. inside a mall or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, do we need to really have a sign? Don't what shit. The hell like, out, not China China is what I want to know. Yeah, Don't we're I mean, what, on the toilet. Shit in the toilet. Yeah, they, they're, there's signs, Rich. I'll we'll go in. I'll go into this next time I can go out again. I'll take those pictures of that. Joe's probably got a T-shirt of that. Joe's always got these cool T-shirts. <laughs> when like a, calls, drop trowel wherever. What, trow it, it says. Don't sit, you know, squat on the toilet. Don't stand on the toilet seat and squat and poop in it. You got to like sit down on it. You got to give it instructions on that. Hey, man, I look, I'm not going to make fun of anybody. I've been to Malaysia and they're probably making fun of me about, you know, some stuff that was happening to me too. <laughs> Dude, that one's great. We're going to have to videotape that sometime just so we've got it for posterity. But the Malaysian, the Malaysian story is, it's a, uh, that's a well, new but since, since we're on the topic, man, um, so Joe, you wanted me to tell this, but what, what happened was is I the last time I was, well, yeah, it was probably the last time I was in Nashville, um, we'd already been out, out touring around for a while. So I'd already been on the road and I, and I had like the opposite problem happen. I couldn't go to the bathroom. So I was like, man, I don't feel good. And, and so, uh, so is this, and, and Mary always does this to me. Like when we, if we're in mainland, like she'll, she'll go into a pharmacy with me and she'll go up to the pharmacist and usually it's it's a very well, most of the time it was it's a, it's a hot japanese lady working there and she's like hey he can't shit what can he use to, that would help him i'm just like looking at her like are you really gonna say like that in front of everybody you know so she does that and like embarrasses the crap out of me and so i thought okay i'll tell rich i can't go to the bathroom and we'll go to the so we go to cbs and there's the same thing there's a lady working in a pharmacy she's like Rich, like, his California voice, hey, man, my friend's from Japan right here. He hasn't shit in, like, four days. <laughs> and I'm just 
looking at him. I'm like, Come on, man. So she's like, well, what? And, she, and they're, so they're, they're talking to me like this is nothing. And I'm already, I'm kind of traumatized by it a little bit. I'm already sweating telling the story. And so I was like, whatever. And she's like, well, you can do like an, an enema thing or you can do something. I said, we need to go from the top down. We got to get all this stuff out. She's like, well, get this. And so they gives me a bottle of magnesium citrate. And Rich was telling me, hey, man, I use this for when I had to do some stuff, when I had to do a, some men's stuff. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, hey, Rich, how much of this should I drink? And he's like, I don't know, man. Just drink the whole bottle. And I, dude, and, and I, look, I don't even have any, I don't have a cup. But I mean, it's, it's pretty big. It, it's big, man. It's like this big. It's like not quite 12 ounces. But dude, if you drank that much of it, dude, you that's all you'd need. I drank the whole bottle of this stuff, right? And so we had to play that night. Rich is playing in his Grateful Dead. Uh, was it a tribute band or a Grateful Dead band? What was it you were playing at? We're playing oh, the... Hooterol, yeah. It's a Jay yeah. Garcia band. Yeah. Okay. Band. So, and he's playing at the Fleet. Was it Farm and Fleet something or other? What's it called? Yeah. Acme Feed and Seed. Feed and Seed. It's a badass club on Broadway. So, bring my guitar because I'm going to play a Rich tonight. So, we, we all go down there. And I felt, man, I, I went to the bathroom a little bit, but it wasn't like anything that bad. You know, I was like, okay, I guess that stuff really works. I drank this whole bottle. And I got video, Joe. I'm playing with Rich up there, and I'm playing the slide thing, and we're going back and forth. And you guys know what, what happens, right? You get that bead of sweat. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Your balls get all tight. <laughs> and you're starting to go, no way this is happening right now. <laughs> and I'm like, on a stage, and the place is packed full of people, man. And I'm looking at Mary, and she's looking at me, and she knows that something's wrong. And she's going, <laughs> And I go, I, I'm thinking that I can't get off the stage. Rich keeps telling me to play more solos. I'm like, no, Rich, we got to stop. <laughs> we got to stop. So he stops the song. I put the guitar down before he's even saying, hey, this is David. I'm already gone, right? I'm already like, and I go downstairs in the bathroom stalls. They're all being used, and I'm pouring sweat. <laughs> and so they're already into their next song. And, I'm, and Mary's like, what do we do? I was like, just come on. So we get out. And I start running down Broadway looking for a bathroom. And I go down there. And uh, I was going to say that I'll, I'll never admit that this really happened. But this is like people watching this now and listening. But So I go in there. And the only place that was open was like Luke Bryan's place. <laughs> <laughs> and I run in there, man. And, and that bathroom was open. And there's still a bunch of people in there. And I swear to God, they probably had to close that place, man. Because it was a, one of the most unreal experiences of my life. Dude, Tell Magnes... Me. Tell me you upper decked them. Dude, I didn't, I didn't, I, I complete, it was as bad as Malaysia, dude. It was like someone just took a, a bucket full of ice cream and just threw it against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and look, and, and listen, and so, and I'm in there and I was like, <laughs> this dude next to me is like, are you okay? And I'm like, no. <laughs> And they're like, damn, man. And I was like, <laughs> and it was like, you you guys, there's nothing else that's like that magnesium citrate thing. It's a different thing to Malaysia, man. It's like a, it's, it's just crazy. And so I'm in there for like 30 minutes, man. I came out of there, like my pants didn't fit anymore. Like yeah. I probably lost like other 10 guys, pounds. Other guys in the band are like, hey, man, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> People thought I was getting arrested as far as, that, as I ran out of that place, right? So I ran. So I come out and Mary order, ordered a pizza. She's already eaten half of it. Dude, that's how long I was there. And the lady's like, is your friend okay? She's like, and Mary doesn't speak English that well at that point. She's like, uh, maybe. <laughs> Dude, I come out solid gray. I'm, a, I'm the color ray, or of uh, Richard's shirt. And I'm just solid sweat. I drink a pitcher of water. She goes, you want some pizza? I'm like, fuck no, I don't want any pizza. And I, I went back again, man. It was terrible. But then I go back. And then Rich is like, you want to play another song? I'm like, no, dude, I can't. I don't even know where I am. I couldn't even lift my amp, man. Anyway, oh I'm sorry. I yeah. took over that. That's, that's, Rich, that's, that's a new song for you right there, I think. I almost shit my pants. Uh, yeah. Well, well, Acme well, yeah, feeding seed. Or... I mean, <laughs> supposedly Dave said that it was so violent, it lifted him about six to eight inches off the toilet seat when it was happening. <laughs> So it, all I was thinking about was the story I could tell, and now I've done it, you know. So it's, it's worth it, man. I mean, those kind of traumatic experiences, you can either be embarrassed about it and keep it all in, or you can just embrace it, man. Yeah. I think you tell the best shit stories. 
He absolutely does. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I've I've hurt myself laughing sometimes at these things. <laughs> hey, between myself and my sister, I mean, I could probably write a book on uh, crack your pants stories. <laughs> he seems to tell them with the best and most colorful embellishment, though, when our friend Amy Larrison is present. Because her laugh is so contagious that it just makes it just gives him, you know, wind in his sails when he's telling these stories. But yeah, because she, you know, when you get that laugh where you just start shaking, you're going, and your face is turning red, and then you're you're crying. My sister has that too, where she just like all of a sudden I thought she was like having a seizure. She's laying on the floor like that time my dad shit his pants in TJ Maxx. That story. <laughs> She's telling that in a, in a in a so she starts laughing and then you can't stop. I don't know where this podcast is going right now, but I'm sorry, Joe. That we, I think this is a great segue to uh, Rich's uh, last <laughs> album, the, the Hot Chicken Wisdom. Oh yeah, I loved it. Um, Thank you, man. Just for the audience that doesn't know, like, right? I want to read some of the the song titles. Uh, Day drinking, which I listen to. I'm gonna <laughs> hey, listen to actually tomorrow. After Joe, <laughs> you you might have some experience in that department, Joe. I, I, yeah, I mean, I totally relate to it. One of my all-time favorites, uh, Tick on My Taint. Tick on My Taint, true story. Baby. True story. Is it, yeah, I was going to ask you, is that a true story? True story. Oh, totally true story, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. Yeah. It happened when I was living in Marin County. And I don't know, what, like, I was just like, I went to sit down one morning and I was like, what the hell is that? There's a tick on my taint. I can't see it. <laughs> But it's behind my ball sack, and I'm funny, like, I don't want to find a mirror. You know, I wasn't, like, living at my parents' house where my mom's got one of those mirrors, you know what I mean, on a handle or whatever. So I'm like, all right. I had to go into my girlfriend's work. And my girlfriend is a, at the time was an esthetician. And estheticians are the, are the people that rip hair off of women's cooches. And so she's got her own private room. So I go in there and I drop trowel and I'm like, what's going on here? And she's like, oh my God, it's a tick. And it's and on like, your Congratulations, tent. You get to remove it. And so she did. But it was just like, after that, I'm like, I, 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 I'm like, this has to come out in a song someday. And of course it did. And it's true. It's totally true. It, uh, it totally happened and it was horrible. So I love the rhythm out. of the music. <laughs> Dude, as a child, man, and that shit's not funny, man. When I was a kid, I, I went camping when I was a little kid, and I got one on the side of my nutsack. <laughs> it's, yeah, side of my nutsack is bad, but it doesn't have the ring that tick on my taint. No, dude, dude, that's <laughs> yours. Hey, look, you can't top that, man. I mean, where else is like the worst place you can get one? Yeah. Imagine that lady going home and telling that story to her husband that night. What'd you do today? Honey, you're not going to believe this shit. <laughs> Rich man stopped by. <laughs> he had a tick on his taint. A what? A what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was one of them big Northern California deer ticks, too. Woo. Oh. Get out of no, here. No, but the album is awesome. Um, I, I like how it's... it's 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 got the variety, but it you know you have the the funny in it as well, the humor. And uh, now I played it for my wife this morning; she loved it. Oh, that's great! Awesome, thank you. No, I like it. It's uh, there's a little bit of seriousness, but there's you know, it's tempered with a lot of funny songs. I think that yeah, you know, I I like the humorous aspect or the fun aspect of music. So to me, it's. They're not all funny songs, but, you know, I, I do enjoy a good humor song. I, I grew up listening to Dr. Demento, and that stuff rubbed off on me big time. It's just DJ in L.A. who was friends with Graham Parsons back in the day and everything. They were all chums, all those that whole crew. I'm sure Chad probably knows him personally. But um, he was on KMET, man, and I would tune in every Sunday to hear his show because he would just play the most outlandish, wacky, irreverent songs you've ever heard in your life. And I loved it, and I would tape it, you know, back when you would tape the radio shows with a cassette player so I could listen to the songs again and get them again. I mean, Dead Puppies Aren't Much Fun, The Existential <laughs> Blues. Yeah, it's like, you know, and he played, then he played some of that classic Louis Prima and stuff, too. It was a really cool show. It's a great show. But it rubbed off on me big time. 
Where'd you get your first start in, in, in music? Were you did you grow up in a, in a musical family or? My papa played something... piano, and they they forced my sister and I into playing piano when we were little. And uh, I always had terrible piano teachers. They just were always like disciplinarians and made it totally not fun, you know. But but at the same time, getting that musical sort of foundation with piano is a really good place to start. So that was good. And then in seventh grade, they had a talent show at middle school and there were these eighth graders that had a band and they came on and they played Since You've Been Gone by Rainbow. And the oh, cafetorium went upside down. Everybody was going ape shit for these guys. They ripped it up. And, uh, I was like, oh, man, I got to do that. I got to get a guitar. And so it was a year before I got a guitar, but I got one and started playing, and I loved it. I just loved it. I loved it. And then got in a band in high school, and had, we had a blast, and it just kind of kept going from there. It's just I just love doing it so much. It feels so good. And it's like, you know, I was just watching uh, the Shakedown stream tonight, which is the thing they do weekly with the Grateful Dead, and they'll have a different guest, guest on every week. Bob Weir, the, you know, guitar player and, and uh, singer from the Grateful Dead that played with Jerry alongside Jerry uh, was the guest tonight. And he just said, man, I just really miss lighting people up. And that's the best part about it is when you're playing a gig and you see people just like so in the moment enjoying the music, you know that they're not thinking about their bills that are due or their relative that's not doing well. Or any of that, it helps people push the reset button down, and it's important in life. I mean, there's healthy ways to do it. Like I, I for me personally, there's three things that do it in life. And one is love, and the other one is surfing, and the other one is music. And I'm finding as I get older, and you have to work to keep your health and feel better every day, day to day. I'm adding a fourth. Health is on there now too, right? You don't notice it when you're a kid because you feel pretty good most of the time, you know. But you, your body feels it when you don't do the right things a little bit more, a little faster when you get older. But music is a huge part of that. I mean, it's <clears throat> I can't imagine. I've, I've tried to work in, you know, other day jobs that weren't involved in music, and I just felt miserable. It really. Oh, so like David and I. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's just like, so I just, I said, you know, I'm going to really focus on just doing music. That's all I want to do. And for, for a while, all I did was tour and play. And that's how I made my living. But I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have to worry about it. You know what I mean? I could say, like, all right, I'm going to take the next three months. And I'm going to live with my folks in Arizona. Because we were touring so much out of Arizona anyway, I just get picked up on the way, you know, to go out and run. Because in California, you can't go west on the tour. You know I mean? Yeah. That's kind of the nice thing about being in Nashville, too, is that there's three major interstate highways that intersect this town, which means you have six directions on interstates to leave town. 90% of the tour bus business is in this town for the whole country. Because in a 24-hour drive, you can be in 90% of the country's music live markets. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. It's like the hub, huh? The yeah, it is hub. And it's funny, too, because, you know, in the South and on the East Coast, when those cities were formed, you didn't have modern transportation. So the cities are closer together because it took longer to get between cities because you were on horseback or then later train. And as soon as the trains they put in the transcontinental railway, all of a sudden the cities were a lot further apart because you could travel a lot more distance each day. So being out here, all the cities are close together. You know, you have major cities that are pretty close together. So it's easy to tour, really easy to tour. Are you working on any uh, new projects, new album or anything? Or uh, Yeah, I've been doing some writing. Um, and I really like some of the new stuff I'm writing. And I was just thinking yesterday as I was driving around, I was listening to that killer new Stones track. Have you guys heard that? I haven't heard it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's part of the new Goat's Head suit box that's going to get released. And uh, it's called Scarlet. And you can, you know, find it on YouTube or whatever and check it out. It's really cool. It's an original recording from the Goat's Head Soup Sessions that didn't make the record. So it's classic Stones. And the best part about it is Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin was in the area and he came in and played guitar on the track. Oh, dude, that's, that's awesome. killer. So we've got that's Jimmy killer. Page playing with the Stones 
Scarlet, check it out, everybody out there. It's really an awesome cool track. But anyway, I was driving down the road listening to this track going, man, they just dropped a single, and everybody's talking about it, and how cool is that? And, you know, you know, it's just easy, and I'm just – I'm ready to record a, a single and put it out, you know. But it'll be a while. I moved into a condo recently, and I love it here, but I lost my – full featured studio that I had at the house where I could record drums and everything. So I'm a little hampered and, and you know, it's not easy to get out into a studio and record these days with the pandemic. Right. Happening, so how about you, David, you got anything? I know you said you're talking about dropping the album soon, right? Yeah. We, well, we were, it was supposed to go before the, right when the COVID thing happened right around the Germany time in May, but so we just kind of put it off, but we're trying to figure it out right now. But you know, Rich produced our both of these albums for us, and uh, that's another job that he has. It produces bands and other people, and it's kind of cool to have friends like that where you're like, "Hey, man!" Because producer is everything. A producer could be somebody that helps you with, you know, getting a band together or getting a, the songs or the studio or whatever. Rich is the Rich is like the Motel Six. Rich is the our cook. He's our guitar player that plays with <laughs> us. He's our driver. He organizes the band, the studio, and it also he mixes it because he's a really good editor. I'm a really good editor, you know. So he's yeah. really good. I'm a good editor. I'm a good editor. I'm a good editor. So he's <laughs> he does all that stuff, and it's just really cool to to be able to have somebody like that. And also, and me and him do this all the time. We'll just send each other songs. Like, hey man, what do you think? And I, I don't know if Rich probably forgot to mention this, but he's probably got the best slide guitar player in the United States that doesn't live in the United States anymore playing on his record, too. I don't know if you forgot, probably forgot to mention that. Well, but, um, there's no doubt about that. If you listen to the song <laughs> of the Roman Slave, I have Becca Bramlett singing backup vocals on it. And Becca is the daughter of Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett, and she can sing her ass off. She's one of the best vocalists in the country. I have no doubt about that. But she put some vocals down on this track and she called me right after it. And she's like, who's playing slide on this record? I'm like, well, that's David Ralston. And you could just tell her she, she gasped. She was like, <gasps> because Dave has this history with her dad, Delaney. Dave saved Delaney's life at one point in time. We had Delaney for a few years more because of David. He saved, he saved Delaney's life one night. And, and, and Becca knows that, and, you know, and she was just so taken aback to hear Dave's name and to associate it with the beautiful slide playing that he had done. And and I know that she appreciates what Dave did for her dad, that they actually reconnected and had a really heartfelt phone call after that happened. So there's a whole another example of music bringing people together right there. Yeah. That's a heavy story. That's not even near as good. As, that's a that's a that's a tough story though about uh, Delaney when when all that happened with him. But it was and, and it was, the cool thing was is that enough of him rubbed off on me that she knew right away. Like because my playing's not like a it's not like it's great. It's just different. It's like a offbeat kind of weird thing like her dad did. You know, I think yeah, but the thing about it is, you know, really what moves people in music is not technical proficiency. I mean, you can. And musicians are always impressed by that because they wish they had practiced harder as well. But the thing that moves the average music fan and the, and the music listener is emotion. And Dave has that in spades. Dave's intonation, playing slide guitar is not easy. His intonation is spot on. He's great. And he never runs out of like, I mean, his tone. It doesn't matter. Like Dave was like, oh my God, you got to hear this pedal I got. It's killer. It's everything I've been looking for. And it just comes in and it sounds amazing because Dave's an amazing slide player. But then I'm like, Dave, it sounds like every other rig you play through, brother. You just sound good no matter what you're playing through. He can be playing acoustic, playing slide, and it sounds like it's the best slide acoustic tone you've ever heard. Okay, keep going. I need more of this. He's modest, but he's a monster. He's a monster slide player. And when all this is over, all this COVID stuff is gone, he's coming over and we're putting together a killer tour because yep. man, we have a blast playing music together. We have so much fun playing together. It's stupid. Yeah, Joe, when, when, last time we played in Indiana, we played because we got kind of a, a weird thing. We played in, in Kokomo, my hometown, and it was packed. You know, it was like all my folks. It's not from the place the Beach Boys sing about. 
Just no, no, no. It's a, spoiler it's a alert. Yeah. It's a. Uh, anyway, so we went there. We played up there, and then we went to Indianapolis and played like a makeshift place where it was like the the side of a bowling alley, which is not really the coolest place in the play. Where there's no stage. This was not your average bowling alley, by the way. Yeah, it was like this a, a thing Kmart. Was like a multiplex. It had. It was huge. You know, the only thing it didn't have is a strip club and a car wash. Right. That's everything. <laughs> <laughs> it had like a massage parlors in there. It was nuts. It was crazy. So we, we, we're in there, and, I, and I'm not even, I'm not, this is not for effect. We completely tore it to the floor. I mean, we were playing good anyway, but then to hear that crowd, it was the people, were, they were going nuts, Rich. Yeah. Yeah, and our, our friend Crystal, who's a DJ on the Q95, the classic rock station in Indianapolis, she came out. She gave us the full pro, like, oh, hey, yeah. people from Q95, I'm about to introduce a band here that's going to cook your gizzard. You know, she was yeah. just playing it on. It was classic. I had a, I talked to her today, Rich, by the way. I'm going to have uh, her do Joe's podcast, too. She'd oh, be great, right. man. She's had a long career. Um, she's a huge uh, fan and friend and just – She's a huge supporter of all we do. So, yeah. but you know, we're but this for real, man. We're gonna go and do a full on tour and go everywhere with the with uh, playing because it's gonna be awesome. Play half of Rich's music, half of our music, and it doesn't matter. It's like you you can't really tell what when things change because it's he's Americana, dude. I mean, he's the epitome of what that music is. And then like I don't have to teach. We don't have to teach like guys from here about this like they like grew up playing that crap you know what i mean so it's just really it's a different thing when we play in the states for sure yeah dave won't admit it but i pretty much <laughs> named his band oh that's not that's not oh that's, you did listen, tell me that yeah that, that's not that's not uh fiction at all <laughs> <laughs> like this is a, so now you know rich right because i was trying to tell you the story before like Rich, when he gets, he'll get totally serious on occasion, right? And just have this look on his face, like complete seriousness. But after that World War II vet came up to me and Mary and stopped our show to tell us that he was in Okinawa in 1945 and made, us so, made him so happy to hear us play in American Pickers, right? It's like a movie. We're just, yeah. I mean, it was like someone just ripped the, the needle off the record. Like, eh, like there's dead silence in there. And Rich comes up to us as, as the most sincere thing. He's like, he looks at me straight in the face. He's like, dude, that's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. You got to change the name to rise right now to Okinawa Americana. Like he just said, it's just like right then. <laughs> That's exactly how it happened. I was like, Did you have a band name before that? No, it's just Dave and Mary. Oh, just Dave and Mary. Okay. Yeah, it's like Peter, Paul, and Mary. But it was like you know, so but it's it that name because now you don't have to explain people what it is because it's right. kind of hard, man. It's yeah. hard to explain. It's just right there. And it's just, that, that is like what you and Mary do is so unique. There is nothing like it in the world. They're the only people that do it. It's like the Grateful Dead, right? They're like Bill Graham used to say this about the Grateful Dead. He's like, they're not the best at what they do, but they're the only ones who do it. You know, that <laughs> these guys are the best at what they do and they're the only ones who do it. They fuse traditional Okinawan folk music with American roots music, Americana. And it's fantastic how well it works. It's unbelievable. You know, and Ry Cooter has absolutely explored that same thing in the past. He did an album uh, with some Okinawan musicians because he was so intrigued by Okinawan folk music. And Dave has really just taken it to this whole another level. Well, I think the thing that, that helps too is, I mean, when you got, like Mary's got her own, life experience and she really understands and loves all different kinds of music and I, i've played with these other musicians and you know, rich has met some of them and they're great but then there's just that thing that she brings and she gets along with everybody and she and she's got she's like a sponge i don't know if you've noticed that i mean her, how good is her english now compared to like four or five years oh, ago yeah right? she, i met her two years ago yeah amazing so rich i don't know if you knew this but uh mary had a show with joe a radio show that they did every week so it was a weekly radio show. So they and now they teach at the same place. You know, Joe teaches judo and she teaches Sanchin at the same place. So this is a big circle of craziness. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you yeah, Joe's you want Joe on your team when shit goes bad because he's he'll choke you the fuck out. 
Like, that's his <laughs> can, I, can I be? I'm gonna be uh, like head of security on your tour. And also, yes, jo Joe's also it. been Joe's been M Joe's been MC for us too at the Okinawa Americana Festival. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that's that's a stressful job though, isn't it? Okay, I was everything's going. It. Everything's going wrong. Talk for 10 minutes about nothing. Okay. Yeah. Dude, 10 minutes. <laughs> I remember, I can't remember who I was seeing. But they used to have this festival in Los Angeles called Street Scene. And you would go downtown and they'd have it blocked off and there would just be stages all over the place, right? Well, we're going to see, maybe it was UB40 or somebody, but they were having some, some kind of technical difficulties. And the crowd's kind of getting restless. And so... Who pops up on stage that was hanging out and they just asked him to go up and like do some stand up improv, but Cheech Marin from Cheech and Chong. <laughs> so he gets up there and he starts like just improving. He starts like, hey, you know, he's telling his jokes and everything. And then he's like, he kind of runs dry after about four or five minutes and he just turns to the side of the stage. He's like, fuck you, do 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it, it, it's a cool thing, man, to, to see. And, man, I, I mean, I've told Joe a hundred stories about Rich, right? And, I, and I'm, Joe, yeah. or Rich knows about you, and he knows about all these different people in our lives from Facebook and just from telling stories. So that's one of the coolest things for me, man, is uh, to get you together with Bryce and Brian and all these different dudes, you know, down in Florida. And now all these people know each other. It's, it's uh, I don't know, that's a cool thing for me. Bring all these worlds together. Absolutely. I love that. And it's all the people that I've met through David have been solid gold, solid gold. Except for that one yeah. guy, but we won't talk about him. <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about him. But you know what, Rich? One thing that you forgot about that you didn't talk about, you're, talk, you're talking about these different things. You forgot number five, and that's one of my favorite songs on your album is I Smoke Pot. Oh, I Smoke Pot. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's the, that song will never leave. Have you heard that, Joe? Yeah, yeah, I oh, did. Oh, dude, that chorus will never leave your head. It's, I mean, I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night, go, I smoke pot, I drink whiskey, <laughs> I sniff coke, but that shit is kind of whiskey. I mean, I hear it will not leave your... <laughs> it's got a good jingle well, to it. <laughs> they, they would call me from the car sometimes, him and Mary, they're driving around, and I wouldn't hear anything except the song playing in the background, and then Mary singing along with it. <laughs> Mary, love, that's her favorite song, I smoke pot. <laughs> I was playing uh, earlier. I was playing uh, your first album for my wife too. I was like, "Listen to this song." I was like, "Mama found my bong." Oh yeah, <laughs> That's That's another, dude. honest to God, true story. I, I came home from junior college, and my mom was in a mood. And if you've ever met my mother, you know she is a saint, and she is just the sweetest woman you'll ever want to meet. She's really just something special. She really is a special person, and she was pissed about something. She was talking to me, and I'm like, wow, man, I don't know what happened, but she's in a bad mood. It didn't happen that often. So then I go back to my room. I'm like, well, I'm getting out of the kitchen. I'm not going to hang out here. The vibes are, man, you can cut them with a knife. You know what I mean? It was thick. So I go back to my room all the way down. At the long, we had a long ranch-style house at that time, so I'm on the other end of the house. I walk into my room literally right on the middle of my bed. <laughs> She had found it in the closet. It was a bong that I made, a hookah that I had made out of one of those one-gallon-sized Martinelli's apple juice bottles. And I had an Erlenmeyer flask stopper from science class that I nicked in the top. And it had a bowl and then a little T-valve that came out of it with two tubes so two people could hit this thing at the same time. And we'd take the dead shows and stuff. It was always a hit, pardon the pun. So anyway, I'm like, I just sunk. I went down like, oh. You know, I should have like, so I'm like, what do you do? But turn around and walk back, right? Because she's going to expect that you're, you know, so first thing out of her mouth, she just like, first she like puts down the knife, whatever she was cooking, dries her hands, put the towel down, puts her hands on her hips and says, what's that for? And I think she was upset because it was made out of glass and she thought it was for smoking Coke or something. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, oh I'm on mom at the hookah, it's for smoking weed. She's like, and I'm like, and nothing else. It's not for cocaine just because it's glass. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's got two tubes so you can smoke at the same time with your friends. And it's like, we, let's open it up and you can smell it and you'll know. I mean, it smells like weed in there, right? You know, and she's like, well, if you're going to do it, I don't want to know about it. So, <laughs> like, dude, my face hurts from laughing, dude. So, anyway, I, I just, yeah, I'm like, well, that's got to come out in a song someday. And it's like, 
it's pretty much true. But it's like, but here's the thing though: that there is one part in there that's not true, and that you know, uh, the seven words that I heard next: just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and I, she never told my dad. She just didn't want to deal with the wrath of Bill Mayhem. So. Hey, she just wait, kept don't let... She's just like, I don't want to see that. You're going to do that? I don't want to see that. Hey, man, but you know this from now, man. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know. So anyway, yeah. I try to pull a lot. I mean, I've had a colorful life so far. And it's, you know, it's not slowing down as far as I can see. It's still pretty exciting. But I've... You know, I try to incorporate all that stuff because it's like we're talking around laughing, telling stories. It's like that's what life's about. You know, some music is and songs are. It's just a it's a very colorful way to tell stories. The, the yeah, it's a, it brings out the artist, right? and melody. It's great. It's a high art form, man. It's really it's the privilege to be involved with. Awesome. Gentlemen, this has been great. We should do this again. Yeah, oh, man, absolutely. He's talking about let's do it. Let's do this off the air. Imagine the shit you'd hear when we're not on air. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having us, Joe. Yeah, no, Joe. Thanks, thanks for having thanks us. For doing that. And Rich, thank you for uh, you know making time. I know it's it's late over there, so I appreciate it. That's all right. I'm a night owl. That, that you know, old habits die hard. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go blast some uh, day drinking and uh, actually do some day drinking. So <laughs> That's right. You guys are just getting ready to go. It's Saturday. There's Get nothing else, there to, to, do. Up. There's right. nothing else to do. Together, though. Are you guys still under quarantine right now? What's going on? Well, almost. I mean, we can't go anywhere. We, I mean, we just now started to be able to go to the grocery yeah. store. They're probably going to close that down too, Joe. Yeah, I know. At the rate that shit's going on over here. Yeah, it's pretty scary, man. Did they ever have to close down the PX before? Um, well, I mean... You can kind of go on base to go to stuff. You can go but, on base and do things, yeah. But like, it's so crazy, Rich. Like, there are people driving around, like taking pictures of why people why plates. Because if you're American, you get a, or if you're self stats, you get a why plate. People like taking pictures. They're in the wrong place. They're not supposed to be here. I'm like, well, what the hell are you doing here? Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, so it's like kind of like getting a little bit uh, people getting a little bit too serious about it. But now it's, I'm just, I'm getting scared too, man. I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. I'm wiping shit off all the time, like. Like you were doing, Rich, like we were talking about before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ounce of prevention, pound of <laughs> care, you know. Just be careful. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Wash your damn hands, people. Do, yep. do, 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 do. Wash your hands. Do. I'm sorry. I got a grandkid. <laughs> wash, wash, wash your hands. Don't you touch your face. See, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys, yeah, I really I appreciate it. Weekend. This is fine, right, man. Yeah. You too. Take care, guys. We'll see you. you too. All right, guys.